Hello, Metro family. Hope you're doing good. I know it's cold outside and we're kind of wondering what's next in our lives as a church. You know, the reality is, is that our building did catch on fire, at least for a little bit, but it's out. And with the winter weather being scary and just not sure what we're doing next, it's got us closed up in our homes and we're trying to figure that out now. You know, I, I've had to think about that as we um, planned for Sunday, that many days we're just ready to be done and to move on from this world. There's things happening around us, negativity, uh, sicknesses, pain. A lot of us are just tired. Um, we see things in our culture that put us down and make us sad. And we have burdens, real things in our lives that cause us to wonder, you know, why? Why is this happening to me, God? And then, of course, there's the persecution that happens because of our faith. Well, it was C.S. Lewis, uh, it was the death of his wife, Joy, that he wrote a book called A Grief Observed. Uh, they were married for a, lo a long time, and she ended up in the hospital with cancer. And so he would keep these notebooks where he could write down and explore the way he was feeling about his grief. He speaks of all the trials that he's feeling, and he kind of explores what it means to have faith in those kind of situations. He later compiled all of those notes into that book, A Grief Observed, and he did that in 1961. One of the things that he writes is, No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I am not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness, like yawning. I keep on swallowing. At other times, it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There is a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting, yet I want the others to be about me. I dread the moments when the house is empty. Later, he asks this. He says, Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is in vain. And what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. He just seemed to not be sure where God was in his life. In the, you know, on the other hand, the Apostle Paul speaks regularly of his hope. He tells the church in Corinth about what he experienced to get to them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2-13, through 13, he says this, he says, Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that th that letter grieved you, though only for a while. 
As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For a godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clean to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. Finding joy in the midst of pain. It's the riddle that we are faced with. Paul, in this passage here to the Corinthians, he shared transparently all that he had experienced in his life. All the ways that people sought to hurt him emotionally and mentally, spiritually and physically. How, in this world, we will face trial and persecutions. But Paul, he finds hope. What Paul sees when he envisions the people who make up this church is hope. He sees the possibilities of the future. Paul looks at those who've been a blessing and an encouragement to him as the proverbial cherry on top of the thousands that spread throughout Asia as he ministers the gospel. Where 1 Corinthians is a call to unity as the church, 2 Corinthians is a call to unity with him as he's teaching them. He has had so many that would that have wanted him to fail because they could not believe that someone who has endured the kind of hardships that he's endured is from God. Why would God afflict his people with these kind of calamities? But Paul, he insists, no, this is the message from God. And later, Paul would actually boast in, this, in these things. In 2 Corinthians eleven thirty, 30, he says, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. But what is his big ask for these people? Make room in your hearts for us. As Paul has made room in his heart for this church, even with the trials, now he says, make room for us. Paul's desire is for unity with his brothers and sisters in the faith. And this is our call today for us. In the midst of pain, in the midst of trial, we got to be unified behind the gospel message. We as God's people have excuses all the time for being sad or angry and disillusioned by what this world is doing. It's difficult to be a follower of Jesus when everything that we stand for is under attack. And honestly, it's overwhelming. I I don't blame those people who give in to the world's demands or who give up entirely. Not that I want them to, but how can you blame them? And people like Paul have written and said to be joyful in every circumstance. That's a bold move. You know, when I say that we are overflowing with joy, how do we have a joy like that that isn't just present but is overflowing, especially when we can't meet together because of snow and ice, the power being out, and especially because our building caught on fire, there's smoke inside, and we don't know what it's going to look like when it comes to trying to fix the building? Well, there's a few ways that I want us to look at, and it comes from this passage. The first is that Paul's joy was not dependent on his circumstance. If my attitude as I live is based on the weather, or how much money I have, or what kind of building I have, I'm probably going to be unhappy most of the time. Uh, I'm living in a situation right now where I don't have a home. I have a house that I'm living in, but it's not really my home. It's it's someone else's. And so there are rules and uh, things that happen that 
I have to work around that I wouldn't have to normally. But if my joy is based on Christ living in me, I can find joy in any situation. When my car breaks down, when my body's in pain and not cooperating, when I'm without food, or when I don't have a church building, or when I don't have a home, all that matters is Jesus. If you remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago, about what it means to be content. Paul speaks of the Macedonians who were extremely poor, and yet they gave of everything they had generously. Those Macedonians, their first concern was giving themselves for Jesus. And Paul and the Corinthian church could see the joy that came from that. Have you known someone who had joy like this? People that are just willing to give when they don't have anything. It's not their circumstance that makes them that way. It's Jesus. You know, one situation I think about is the lost boys of the Sudan. And they were just so joyful, even in the midst of the pain of losing their families. I don't know if you've heard of these young men. You know, the Sudan has known only war for upwards of 75 years, maybe longer. It was in 1987 that the Second Sudanese War began, and it displaced 20,000 young boys of the Nuer and the Dinka tribes. You see, the Muslim North Sudan wanted to convert and change the entire country to be a Muslim nation, and that displaced thousands of these little boys to walk hundreds of miles in single-file lines to find refuge in places like Ethiopia and Kenya. Many of these boys died along the way from things like dehydration and disease, malnutrition, and of course, attacks by wild animals and snakes and other things like that. And then they would be attacked by the rebels from the north, other young men with weapons. And many of these boys were recruited to become soldiers against their own will for the North Sudan army. These camps, they became overwhelmed with these boys, and many of them ended up in Kakuma in Kenya, in Africa. And in 2006, there was an American documentary made uh, called God Grew Tired of Us, because one of the boys had said during the documentary that that's what it felt like. They were suffering so much they had thought that God had grown tired of them and just wanted them to die. These boys, they ended up helping each other through this situation. It's a really neat documentary. I encourage you to watch it. Well, second, Paul's joy, it didn't come from him. It came from his encouragers. Paul often brought someone with him to help him, to help encourage him. If you've read the stories of Paul, you know that he'll bring people like Barnabas and Titus and Timothy and many others. Well, this example, it, became, it began with Jesus. I'm sure that Paul had heard those stories of how each of Jesus' disciples brought a partner with them. They went in twos. They went to encur- with each other to encourage each other, to keep each other accountable, and to know when it was time to go to the next place. We need people in our lives like that to encourage us when times get harder. For me, it's my wife. She reminds me of the things that are the most important, and she helps me when I'm feeling down and when I'm unsure if I'm doing a good job or not. Uh, There are others. Second is my friend Wes. Wes is also a minister, and he knows what ministry is like. Uh, He's a wonderful theologian, and he likes to have fun, and that encourages me that You can have faith and have fun at the same time. There's another man who encourages me, and I'll I'll tell you about him in just a minute. But let me move on to the third point. Paul's joy came from his hope. Paul's mission, it was the same continuing mission of the church, to make disciples. And it was for the sake of the kingdom. And Paul, he was committed to that mission. That brought Paul more joy than anything else. He wanted everyone to hear the message. And so he took it across Asia so that everyone could hear the gospel. 
Paul believed in the Jesus who took his sight away and the same Jesus who restored him back to his normal sight. The one who challenged him to keep on teaching what you're doing, that he would protect him. We need hope like that in our own lives. It reminds me of the book of Lamentations, a dark and depressing book, (laughs) that at its worst, there is no escape. The people have turned in their desperation to cannibalism, and Jeremiah, who's supposed to lead these people, feels like God is against him. Yet in this desert, in this wilderness, the faithfulness of God shines through. It brings Jeremiah's faith to the forefront, and he can write in the midst of the five chapters of Lamentations, right in the middle of it, he says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. There was a time in ministry where I wasn't sure I was going to make it. And it wasn't the recent time. Although that does kind of uh, make me wonder. But it was early on in ministry that I just wasn't sure I could I could continue being a minister. I was hurt, and I wasn't sure I could go on, and, and knowing that there's not really anything else that I'm very good at, or at least I didn't feel like it, and not make a career out of it, I just wasn't sure I could keep going. And it was a man named Silas Shotwell who I went and spent time with for a weekend, and how he listened to the pain and helped me to pray and to restore my faith in God. He helped me to know the hope that I have in Jesus and that I could keep going. And now I've seen what that's like as I've ministered in other places since then and have been some been mostly successful, but in some places not. But because of the way we mature, we figure out and and realize that we're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. But we keep going because of the hope that we have. We all need to see our hope and always have that out in front of us. When pain comes in sickness or in hardship, we see the hope. When the people around us mock us, hate us for what we stand for, call our faith, fake, we see our hope. When Satan tries to defeat us, we see our hope. Back to C.S. Lewis, when his wife Joy was dying of cancer, Lewis says near the end of his book, he says, she said, not to me, but to the chaplain, I am at peace with God. She smiled, but not at me. She turned to the eternal fountain. If you've never seen the film Chariots of Fire, you should take some time to do so. It is the story of several runners, but one in particular, Eric Liddell, a Scottish man who loved God and desired to go into the mission field one day. He was always looked down on, constantly told he couldn't run fast enough and he would lose, but he didn't. He believed his running was a gift from God and something that he cannot waste. Eric ended up making it to the 1924 Olympics, and he said, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Eric found not only his joy, but God's joy. When we have joy, it shines to others. It's shining the joy of Christ. Our joy must shine to the world so that they see the hope that we have in Jesus. And that's God shining through our lives. Let me encourage you. Don't think of the negative things that have happened recently, but think of the joy that you have in Christ and the hope 
that he gives to you. And listen to this song. I hope it encourages you. See you later. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got love. I've got true love instead of pain. There is freedom. Never been more secure